What is up guys, Coach Joe, Office De La Swole, and in this video we're going to be covering deloads, okay? So we're going to talk about what they are, when and why we should do them, and then also different types of deloads, which will actually probably be part two. So if you guys enjoy this video, make sure you check out part two, uh, but we're going to dive right into the nitty gritty of everything encompassing deload periods in your training. So let's talk about what a deload is. And if we're gonna be specific and probably a little bit picky, I don't necessarily like the name or term deload. And I'm learning that words and language are very important, specifically coming from Broderick Chavez, but he is very adamant on how we use language. And typically when we say deload, that means you take offload or get rid of load, which yes, I understand the context of training that can make sense, but sometimes I think about people moving one load to the next, right? So you have somebody who's showing up your house with a moving vehicle, they load it up, they take it somewhere else, and then they offload that where that material still exists, right? It's just somewhere else. And in the terms of training, I like to reference a deload as a period or time where we are decreasing stress and fatigue so that we can increase recovery and then furthermore, produce an adaptation that we're looking for based on our goals. But by definition, if we're gonna talk about deload, it means deloading refers to a planned reduction in training volume, intensity, or both. The rationale behind deloading from a scientific perspective is rooted in the concepts of recovery, adaptation, and injury prevention. We do this after a certain amount of training has occurred, which accumulates fatigue in the body locally and systemically. So. I just paraphrase it into one sense, but there's kind of the bigger gist of what a deload actually is. Now, another analogy that I like to use with deloads is using cars, right? We live in America, everybody here loves cars. So I'm not a super big car guy and I don't really know much about cars, but whenever I equate things to vehicles or machines, it makes more sense in my brain. So the way I equate it is if we're in our vehicle, right? And we're steadily going up a hill or different grades and we're putting our pedal on the throttle, over time, that's gonna cause wear and tear on the vehicle, or we're gonna run out of fuel, or both, right? Now, one thing to take into consideration when it comes to deloads is what type of car are we driving, okay? Because the type of car really indicates and can affect the deload duration or what is happening with our training. So say we have our family Volkswagen, right? That's gonna be a different process and have different effects versus having a big Mack truck or a high performance sports car, right? It's going to give us different parameters and timelines for this deload. So if you don't understand kind of what I said in the beginning, maybe that analogy makes more sense to you. So diving into deeper as to why we deload, obviously we talked about the buildup of fatigue locally and systemically, but there's also neurological effects and there's a mental component of deloading. So for training for a long period of time, that can be daunting and also fatiguing on the brain. Sometimes we just need a little bit more of a central nervous system recoup. And also emotionally and mentally, if we are grinding out week after week, session after session, that takes a toll on our minds as well. So sometimes having that brief period or a prolonged period, which we'll talk about in another video, that can really help just reset everything. It can drive motivation up higher and not only allow the body to recover, but also the mind. So let's dive into the signs of needing a deload, okay? And often what I see, say more often than not, is people deload before they actually have to. And although in a short mesocycle, that may not make a huge difference, but if we're compounding those mesocycles after mesocycles and years and years, and we are taking deloads before they're actually needed, we're losing a significant amount of progress. And there is that point in your training when you do need to put the pedal to the metal, uh, whether that's with intensity, volume, accumulation of both, because we have to kind of get to that red line to really make our body force that adaptation uh, before we give it a bit of a break. And what I see is people kind of start pushing to that red line. They're not necessarily in it long enough and we miss out on some great windows of training that can produce the growth that's needed, but we just don't get there uh, you know, or stay in that kind of window long enough. So you gotta find that fine line of where to be and for how long to really get the most out of your training and also the most out of the deload period. But right off the bat, the first one in terms of signs is gonna be performance declines or stagnation, okay? And I would say don't go based off of one week. If you're having an off week, that's not meaning right away I need to take a deload. This is gonna be a couple weeks, right? Where we are seeing uh, those ebbs and flows or we're having a nice increase in performance for a while. Then all of a sudden we seem like we hit that wall. Well give it a week after another week, maybe reassess, okay? I would say 
two to three weeks max is going to be the indication that a deload is needed, but don't give up right away. Now, second one's pretty obvious. You're going to have a lack of energy uh, and also fatigue accumulation. One thing I know anecdotally with myself and a lot of athletes that I coach is we start to see those aches and pains start to creep up where we're getting more tendinopathy in the elbows or the knees or something like that. Uh, but that starts to become persistent and you are aware that the body is starting to get those low signs of systemic fatigue. Next one's gonna be loss of motivation for training. Now, once again, I have felt all of these that I'm gonna mention, but I know when I've been training really hard and I'm starting to accumulate a lot of that fatigue and the kind of deload or low stress period is about to happen, I start to lose that motivation or it just becomes a little bit more daunting to get into the gym and train or if I know the weights I'm supposed to be hitting and I'm starting to feel that decrease in performance, I just overall lose motivation and can start to feel that creeping up. Another indicator could be persistent delayed onset muscle soreness or DOM. So if you are chronically sore and not recovering, that's gonna be a big sign. Irritability with mood or mood swings. I've definitely felt that before because we are increasing that systemic fatigue totally. We're just wearing down our body. We are becoming more irritable. And on top of that, another one's gonna be disruption in sleep. So if you're getting your, your really good seven to nine hours of sleep every single night, uh, but you start to feel that the sleep is disrupting, you're getting up more often throughout the night, or you're just waking up and you're not feeling like you're recovered uh, and it's just taking you a little bit longer, this is also another sign of systemic fatigue. And the last couple are gonna be, we are more susceptible to injury. So once again, if you're feeling those aches and pains and we keep pushing and pushing that, that can tend to lead to injury. So you have to be aware of where you're at. And last one's gonna be, you may be getting sick more often, which just means that since we have so much fatigue, the body is fighting and fighting and fighting. Our immune system is actually decreasing. So we are gonna be more susceptible to germs that wouldn't affect us if we were totally recovered. Uh, but we're overall just in a more weakened state uh, inside and outside of the body. Now I do want to caveat, if you're feeling one of these on the list, that doesn't necessarily mean you need a deload. This is going to be an accumulation of several of these that I just mentioned, and that's going to be a better indicator than just picking one off the list. Because I'm sure at any point of my training, I can pick one of these off the list and say, oh, I'm feeling you know, less motivated today, or I'm a little bit under the weather, or yeah, my elbows are bothering me, but I can't just go off of one sign of the fatigue and then base that off of what I'm going to do. So look for an accumulation of these and that'll give you a better idea. All right, so now we covered the signs and symptoms of a deload. I want to talk about the general deload guidelines. So a question I get asked often is how often should I be deloading? And to be honest with you, there's no set answer. And somebody who gives you a set answer probably hasn't dealt with a lot of people because there are some genetic outliers who can go for a very long time. And there's also people who a couple of weeks in do need a deload, but I will say that can be dependent on program and also the mindset of the athlete where I may be telling them what to do uh, or maybe not properly understanding how intense or how hard they train, which could force a deload sooner than we need to. But once again, that's going to be the client coach relationship and the mentality of that athlete, which can then be tailored to get the best uh, low stress or management protocol possible for them. But as a guideline or reference, I would say anywhere from the four to six week period for natural lifters is going to be the sweet spot of where we see systemic fatigue climb and then we do need some sort of intervention to manage that fatigue. Now I did say natural lifters because if you are somebody who is enhanced, Typically, you can run uh, a training mesocycle for anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks almost if you structure it properly. And the crazy part about being enhanced is that window that you have for what is required to make progress and how hard you can push it is a lot bigger for an enhanced athlete versus a natural athlete. So if you program properly for an enhanced athlete, you can really push the envelope by starting off with that minimal effective volume and stretch that out over the long haul uh, to really get as many gains as possible in that window um, versus a natural lifter. So something to just be aware of whether you're natural or enhanced or you deal with athletes or clients that are natural and enhanced. Now when it comes to the duration, okay, the typical duration is probably gonna be one week. We will talk in part two about when that would change, but I find it's gonna be once again based on the individual. You can get away with almost doing some low stress break. So it's not a complete deload for a week duration. Maybe it's, you know, 
three to four days of managing some of those variables that can almost continue your progress further than it would have been uh, with you know your set timeline that you gave yourself, if that makes sense. But for the majority, a one week period is enough where we can play around with the variables of volume, intensity, frequency, that type of deal um, to allow the body to recover. And then we can start pushing down on the throttle again and making progress forward. At the end of the day, you're gonna have to listen to your body and kind of get feedback from not only yourself, but your coach to make the right call for you on when and how long that period is gonna be needed. I like to periodize my entire training year. So I have multiple mesocycles. That will be my one big macro cycle. And I try to input these periods in transition blocks of training and obviously working around competitions or once again, I'm a new father. Uh, so that's gonna be an adjustment period for me, which is gonna factor in when I may need uh, one of these you know, deload or reset periods to help uh, further my progress. So it's gonna be a, a kind of a plug and play, but I think if you can plan ahead, it kind of gives you better clarity of where you're heading and you have that course charted. So I'm actually gonna cut this video a little bit short. We do have part two coming up, but before we get there, I just wanted to state that deloads or these periods of manipulating volume and intensity so that you can recover properly is a necessary evil. It's almost like taking one step back for three steps forward. You have to be aware of when these are needed because they absolutely will be, but also know when they're not needed. Because if we're constantly kind of cutting our, ourselves short of progress, that will compound over time. Uh, but your best bet is to be in tune with your body and have a coach or someone able to kind of structure your programming properly so that you know when you're taking these and the purpose of them and making sure that they're prescribed properly. So if you guys enjoyed the video, subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, comment down below. I love answering your questions. If you guys are looking for programming or any sort of help in that realm, we have the link in the description. We got the programming app, which has a ton of options on there. You can either pay per month or for the year, cycle through those programs as much as you'd like to. There's also a la carte programs, and then I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. So once again, in the description, check it all out. Shoot me an email and we'll get you squared away. I always do free Zoom consult calls to see if you'd be a good fit for the one-on-one -on -one coaching. And if not, we have tons of options and people that I can hook you up with to put you in the right hands. But we're gonna get on to the next video, which is going to be the actual framework for deloads and options available to you. So if you like this video, just stay put, go to the next one, part two. Take some notes, pen and paper style, uh, and then you guys will be able to implement this immediately if this is something of need to you. But, of course, guys, stay a lean, mean, strength machine. I'll catch up with you next time. Peace.